folks and welcome back. In this video I'll discuss the second half of photosynthesis known as the Kelvin cycle. But first let's start where we left off in the introduction to photosynthesis lecture. I went into detail about the light reactions of photosynthesis and you should remember a few things from that such as what is the source of electrons for the electron transport chain of the light reactions and what are the products you may remember correctly that water supplies the electrons in photosystem 2. Photosystem 2 is responsible for producing the proton gradient that gives us the ATP as well. Because this ATP is formed from the capture of light energy, it's referred to as photophosphorylation. Photosystem 1 produces the reduced NADPH, that's the higher energy electron carrier. These two products are essential for the second half of photosynthesis, that is, the Calvin cycle. ATP and NADPH deliver the energy captured in the light reaction to the endergonic reactions of the Calvin cycle. CO2 is used here and combined with another organic molecule to ultimately produce the carbon compound, our beloved carbohydrate, glucose. Like the Krebs cycle, Organic compounds are regenerated back into the cycle, but as the Krebs cycle involves all exergonic reactions, the Calvin cycle is a series of endergonic reactions. We can better understand the cycle if we break it down into the three major events that occur here. Carbon fixation, reduction, and regeneration. This all takes place with the help of one enzyme called ribulose-1 5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, but we'll call it Rubisco for short. First is the carbon fixation phase. Here we see CO2 is added to a 5-carbon compound called RUBP to make a 6-carbon intermediate molecule that quickly breaks down into two 3-carbon intermediate compounds. Next is the reduction phase. ATP phosphorylizes these compounds and NADPH reduces them by giving them electrons. The three carbon products are now reduced and have more energy than before. The new compound is called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or G3P. G3P is the payoff molecule meaning that two of these molecules can become the monosaccharide glucose fructose or galactose. At this point, however, it would take three turns of the cycle to produce one G3P. Look back up here. See? Three CO2 go into the cycle. Six ATP are needed to phosphorylize that. Six NADPHs to reduce to get six G3P molecules. One G3P is extra as five more G3P need to go back into the cycle to keep it going. So one turn of the cycle for each CO2, three turns of the cycle for one G3P, and six turns of the cycle for one glucose molecule. The last phase is called the regenerative phase, which is a series of complex reactions that restore the GP3s back into RUBP to continue the cycle. So, to do some accounting, for 1G3P, it took 3 CO2s, 9 ATPs, and 6 NADPHs. To make glucose, simply multiply all that by 2. Why? Because 2 G3Ps are needed to make 1 glucose. That's the Calvin cycle that so many of us take for granted. Without the light reactions in the Calvin cycle, life was, as we know it would not exist. However, something peculiar has been discovered with this cycle. All the time that plants are performing photosynthesis, their stomata must be open to allow the exchange of CO2 and oxygen. At the same time, the plant is evaporating water out of the stomata in the process called transpiration. On hot, dry days, plants are in danger of drying out. So they've adapted to this problem by closing their stomata when the temperatures are high. While this stops transpiration, it also stops photosynthesis. 
So no CO2 can enter the leaf and oxygen is trapped inside. This is when things go wrong with the plant. Instead of fixing O2 to make sugar, as in the normal process, the Calvin cycle begins to fix oxygen instead. Without the introduction of a new carbon source, the ATP, NADPH, and the RUBP all get used up and no sugar is made. There's a loss of energy to the plant in photorespiration. There are a few hypotheses out there as to try to explain why plants do this when it's detrimental to the plant. While it is trying to conserve water, it saps energy from the plant. No sugar and no ATP is made. Luckily, photosynthesis occurs more often than photorespiration. There are, however, some plants that have adapted strategies to overcome this problem. Nature will find a way. They still close off their stomata to prevent drying out, but have a different way of getting their CO2 source. These alternative pathways are only found in certain plants. Most plants are classified as C3 plants because they produce a three carbon compound after carbon fixation. Plants called C4 plants have two distinct types of photosynthetic cells. The first are just like the cells in the C3 plants. They're mesophyll cells. These normally do photosynthesis in the C3 plants. The other are special cells around their vascular tissue where the Calvin cycle takes place. These are called bundle sheath cells. And C4 plants. Mesophyll cells have a process for concentrating CO2 by fixing it to a four carbon acid called malate. Don't worry about remembering that name right now. But this four carbon compound is why these plants are called C4 plants. On hot days when the stomata are partially closed, the enzyme PEP carboxylase assists in fixing the CO2. PEP carboxylase has a greater attraction for CO2 than it does for oxygen, unlike rubisco. So photorespiration is reduced. The malate releases CO2 into the bundle sheath cells where the Calvin cycle is taking place. Examples of C4 plants you may be familiar with are corn, sugarcane, and crabgrass. I've noticed crabgrass often takes over my lawn in late summer. Knowing what you may have learned here, can you explain why that's the case? Another alternative pathway has also evolved to combat the issue of hot, dry weather. CAM plants use a sim similar method to the C4 plants. CAM stands for Crassulation Acid Metabolism. Crassulations are plants better known as succulents, like this jade plant. They have plump leaves filled with water. Anyhow, they capture the CO2 and store it on a 4-carbon acid, but what's different to the C4 plants is that this is done exclusively at night. During the day, the stomata can be completely closed as the CO2 source is released and the sugars are made. So that's how the plants convert carbon dioxide into sugars. I've even included some adaptations that plants have when the conditions are not favorable to photosynthesis. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, bring them to class and we'll see you then. Thanks a lot.